So good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, Amit Kundal. I'm the Associate Dean for the School of Design, Art and Performance at Flame University. I'm absolutely excited and thrilled to welcome my friend, Professor Sushi Suzuki, right from Kyoto Institute of Technology in Japan. He is an Associate Professor with the Kyoto Institute of Technology and Kyoto Design Lab, where he teaches courses and coordinates projects around innovation, design thinking, and entrepreneurship. He's also the lead instructor in the nine-month globally distributed Emithetan Sugar Program, where students take up innovation challenges posed by leading corporates across the globe. Sushi also co-founded founded Kyoto Startup Summer School, which is an intense two-week program for aspiring entrepreneurs in Japan and most international entrepreneurship education program. Previously, he co-founded the Paris D School and was the executive director of the Emit. I mean, it's a legendary program called the ME310 program at the Stanford University. So she also set up the innovation team for the Panasonic in, in Europe and was one of the co-founding members of a Japanese startup company that handles antique kimono and accessories online. And a concept developer for Yukando, a German-based semantic product search engine. Sushi was born in Kyoto, Japan, but has spent over 15 years in the US and over five years in Europe and has traveled to over 16 countries. He holds a MS in Mechanical Engineering from Stanford University and a Bachelor of Sciences in Mechanical Engineering and BA in Studio Arts from Rice University. More importantly, what I know about Sushi is that whenever he goes on the stage, he probably gets the loudest applause. Right? So let's give it off for Sushi. Thank you so much, Sushi, for you know joining us today. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing you and again, of course, but I'm sure this time again, it will be fascinating. All right. Thank you for the full intro, Amit. Glad, glad to be here, despite, unfortunately, this time around, we're across the screen because I know last time we did the session, I was actually... Uh, in India as we were doing it. Oh, I'm on the spotlight. But yes, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for making it. I know this session is optional. So I guess you saw the poster and was wondering what kind of name is Sushi Suzuki or what is this new kind of design about? So let me share my screen and jump right into it. So yeah, uh, today I'm going to be talking about innovation through design. And by the way, I will keep the chat and the Q&A button open. So if you have something throughout, I'll uh, feel free to throw me a question or whatever there, and I will see if I can answer it throughout the presentation. If it's kind of off mark, I might save it to the end as well, but I'll try to get to it. Uh, so yeah, about myself, I guess I don't really need to do much here since Amit did a lot of it already for me. But yes, I am mostly an academic, have been at Stanford working there, helped start D School Paris in France, and I'm currently now for about eight years at the Kyoto Institute of Technology, and I'm at my home in Kyoto currently. But as you also heard, I have some experience in industry as well, working for places like Panasonic, trying to do, uh, let's say, innovative pro product development, as well as uh, being part of some startups as well. Nothing that really made it big, but kind of a good experience to see both the big and the small as well. So I have lived in four of these countries. I feel that like I need to update this a little bit, but still, um, I am Japanese by birth, but as you could probably tell, I speak much more of like an American than a Japanese person. And this really is not necessary for this presentation because I'm giving a talk in English, but I usually give talks in English and I have this slide up here to show why my Japanese is so bad. Luckily, I don't have to make that excuse today. So the thing I would like to talk about today, and I'm going to have a lot of case studies just to sh uh, show you, is this thing that's been, I don't know, up and coming or have been very established called design thinking. I'm sure you've heard of it somewhere, but maybe haven't really read into it or just think design thinking is just another kind of design. Well, I want to try to spend today shedding a little bit of that myth and also going a little bit deeper into design thinking, explaining that maybe what you think about the term designer, what you know of the word uh, design is a little bit different than how many of us practice it. So this is one definition that I use. Design thinking drastically increases the chance of discovering an innovation. And the key word I'd like to put in there is that it increases the chance of. 
there's not a process or approach or methodology out there that is always going to get to an amazing innovation. Because if you could come to something like that, then everyone's going to use it and it's not going to be a differentiator anymore. So I have been part of many, many design thinking projects, many of which have failed catastrophically, as well as many of which have succeeded and some which have succeeded really big as well. And I'll share some of that as well. But design thinking is not industrial design. And this is the challenge that we live, or at least people in my community uh, live with, is that when you hear the word design, these are the things that people imagine, like a very nicely crafted with, let's say, good looking curves, uh, Fritz Hansen neck chair, or like this a little bit provocative Philippe Stark juicer. Yes, these are all designed objects, but so are these as well. I, I picked things that were very ancient. Uh, like the wheelbarrow or like a stone tools. But these are also designed as well, right? And when you think about the word design, these are not the things that come to your mind. And industrial design is a fairly modern thing, yet this is almost entirely what we think of when we think of the word design. Um, usually this is a part where I would do like, do people know why it's called industrial design? Obviously, it's a little hard to have that interaction through the screen. But industrial design came after industrialization. So we're still talking about uh, 300 years ago or something. Until then, as we some of us still do right now, most stuff was made by craftsmen, people who both designed, defined, and made the stuff at the same time. But after industrialization, and we started having these factories that could produce so much of stuff very, very quickly and easily. Uh, what ended up happening was that the people who were making it weren't the ones who were actually designing it. And that's a fairly modern thing. It seems obvious now, but, and at that point, you needed to have a specific group of people who were able to design and also sort of tell the people in the factory how to make it and et cetera, et cetera, as well. So that's kind of the birth of industrial design in itself. Or design, the more broader term, is something I would argue is something that we've been doing ever since we uh, went beyond animals, per se, in this image. Um, we're pretty much the only creatures that design excessively, right? Yeah, some birds might build nests or things like that. But I mean, look at the stuff around you. It's all been designed by someone. No animal goes this far. So in order to explain design thinking, and mind you, there are many, many uh, definitions and ways of, let's say, taking apart design thinking out there. Um, but this is the framework I use uh, that I actually didn't come up with. It's something that was shared to me when I was working in, uh, <clears throat> when I was working in France. Okay, I already got a question out here, but... I will get to this one a bit later because I'm not entirely sure what the theory of alienation is. So yes, the three P's, people, place, process for design thinking. And I'm going to jump in with process and it is super abstract. Uh, there are few, I'm going to say there are two entities who are very, very well known for, let's say, being the birthplace of design thinking. Even though the, let's say the practice or the approach, there's been a lot of academics who have been experimenting with it um, way over the years. But the let's say the modern reincarnation of design thinking was very much popularized by the Stanford D School and IDEO, a design consultancy in California. And I'll talk more about them later as well. But this is what the Stanford D School uh, puts out as their design thinking. Understand, observe, point of view, ideate, prototype, test with lines going back and forth. Here's, I mentioned IDEO. Uh, here's what the C of IDEO put together in a Harvard Business Review article, I wanna say about around 2007 or so. Inspiration, ideation, implementation. Very big, right? Here's Stanford University's ME310. Start with defining the problem, exploration, frameworks, brainstorm, prototype and test, and redefine the problem. And then of course, going around and around in circles until you get to something hopefully that you can accept. Um, yeah, there is no sort of one, let's say, clean process chart of what design thinking is. It's a little bit more of a nebulous concept, abstract concept that it's hard to put into one diagram like this. Um, oh, yeah, I always say like the reality is a little bit messier as well. It's never that clean. But there are certain aspects of it that is sort of 
let's say, constant or shared amongst the community. One is the importance of exploration, getting out there and getting information to have new insights for inspiration or new insights for developing ideas. And a lot of people think this is just neat finding, interviews, observation, because that's what design thinking has become to known as. But that could also encompass a lot of other things like market research, benchmarking. I'm not going to cover all of it, but it's not also just sort of asking what people want and making it either. That's one of my pet peeves is that a lot of people are like, oh, design thinking. That's when you go out and talk to people, ask them what they want and make it. Yeah, if it was so simple, right? Um, I love this quote from Harry Ford. If I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Well, yeah, if you don't know what a car is, you have no idea that you want one, right? So the point of a designer or engineer, someone who's trying to create innovation is to see beyond what people want right now and be able to think beyond it. But nevertheless, getting that insight from people is very, very important, which is why need finding exists. And there's one, well, one famous case study I want to share here is actually a Stanford professor I got to learn under. He also had a company that was working with um, Alcoa, the world's second largest aluminum company. And they came up with this packaging called a core fridge pack. Uh, they don't exist in Japan because we have a very different lifestyle than Americans. I have no idea if this exists in India, but I do have a video to show you how it works. Imagine having your own vending machine. Fridge pack is available with Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola Light, Sprite, and Fanta. Fairly obvious, right? It's a box of soda or drinks that you can put straight into uh, the refrigerator. But where did this start from? Well, Alcoa, as I mentioned, was the company that uh, sponsored this project. And in the late 90s, they were having, or sorry, early 90s, they were having a problem where a lot of these plastic bottles, we call them pet bottles in Japan for PT, uh, were starting to become very popular that even vending machines started carrying them. And the company wondered, okay, uh, how could we get people to use aluminum cans more for their sodas? And with that, they hired this company called Point Forward, who went out and talked to 28 families in four cities within the U.S. Um, and discovered this. So on the right is your fairly typical uh, family-sized American refrigerator. And on the left is how it was in a, how the packaging was until that point. And the astute of you might notice from here that there's really not a good way of putting this in here. You can see that bottles have their own place, but, and cans have a little bit here. Uh, but you can see that if you bought this box, in order to put it into the fridge, you have to open it, take it apart and put it one by one into the fridge. Not a very, very good user experience. So that was the insight they ultimately started with. They called it the post-purchase barrier to consumption, getting cans into the fridge. And with that, with brainstorming and talking to packaging companies, but not only that, also talking to the factories that make these kinds of packaging uh, material, they ended up creating this uh, fridge pack, which they called it the greatest uh, innovation in packaging since the plastic bottles, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what was funny around this era is that um, I, I don't know how it is in India, but in most of the world that I know, Coca-Cola and Pepsi are pretty much the same thing. Um, they taste pretty much identical. But Pepsi came out and said like, hey, we don't compete with packaging. We compete with taste, even though most people can't tell the difference. Um, nevertheless, like a few years later, they had their own version as well. So this is a very common way you'll see packaging in supermarket at this point. And it all started with designers talking to visiting homes and talking to users trying to figure out what the issues they have with their fridges are. <clears throat> All right, next up is synthesis and ideation. So it's not just finding, let's say, problems and trying to solve it, but taking it back, digesting it, and coming up with many unique ideas, as well as making sure you focus on the right parts. I assume most people here are too young to know what this is. Um, even I'm a little bit young to know what this is, but this is the Apple Newton. It was a handheld 
computer, this is before the word tablet or smartphone existed, uh, back in the 90s. And the trend was this. We had mainframe computers, desktop computers or personal computers, laptops. It's going to get smaller and be something of a handheld device. And sure enough, some companies were working on it, but they really didn't ask themselves, what should a handheld computer be compared to a laptop? So this device could actually do what most computers can. Like, apparently can even do spreadsheets. Like, who actually does spreadsheets on a smartphone? Okay, some people do, but still very a few of them, right? And it was just very, very difficult to use. Um, this is around the time of Apple when Apple was really doing badly. And uh, Steve Jobs was after he was kicked out of the company and before he came back. Um, but yeah, Apple really missed the mark with this product. And they kind of learned from that. And the second attempt they had at that small format computer, it was very different, right? An iPhone does not remind you of a laptop or a desktop because the things you want to do while mobile is very different as well as the interface uh, as well. They've really, really thought through and synthesized what a mobile computing should be. And then, yeah, uh, with regards to brainstorming, I'm not going to cover all of this, but another thing that design thinking is very, um, let's say, cares a lot about or our community cares about is that we have to have sort of the right atmosphere or right mood and having these kinds of rules for brainstorming so that everyone can come up with their ideas is very, very important for us. Next up, rapid prototyping. Part of design thinking that I like a lot because I like making things, um, but also it's often missed in like a lot of the business literature. And the problem with the term prototype is that most people, when they hear prototype, they think of something like this. Very nice fit and finish. It's not quite a final product yet, but it's like one step before that. And usually when a company like, let's say, announces a prototype, these are the things you see, which is why we think these are the what prototypes should look like. But in reality, something as rough as this can be a prototype. This is a marker, clothespin, and a, a film case. I, you don't see those anymore these days, just duct tape or tape together. And this was actually a prototype for a surgical instrument. The urban legend goes that a designer, engineer, and a doctor who was going to be using the surgical device uh, was discussing to see, okay, we have this technology, how could it turn into, let's say, a real surgical machine? And they were sort of waving their hands around and doing drawings. But then the designer realized, like, if he could just make the shape really quickly, the conversation will become a lot more specific. And it did. And this is the kind of prototyping we do, very rough prototyping that allows us to sort of develop our ideas further. Here was a gesture control system for a car that uh, my classmates were building when I was at Stanford. And the idea was this, in a car, you have to push buttons and now touch screens. Sometimes there are these knobs, but what if you could do it with gestures? Just saying like, next song, volume up, things like that. Uh, and they wanted to prototype this, but in order to actually make a uh, vision or sorry, uh, vision, I'm not, I'm missing the word, something recognition system, optical recognition system, and have the algorithms to do this with technology in 2006 was really daunting. It's possible, but it's a lot of development efforts. So what they ended up doing was just putting a camera here, having this like fake driving simulator and told the user, hey, try out this driving simulator for us with a gesture interface. Uh, and then we'll change the audio and things like that for you. But what they ended up doing was that in the next room, there was a human being looking at this camera and controlling the audio of the simulator right here. And you can imagine building something like that takes less than a day. It's just taking wires and connecting it. There's no programming necessary whatsoever. And they realized by doing this, people actually liked it. And after that, they actually spent nine months coming up with an optical recognition system and technology that would be able to identify people's gestures and be able to control stuff in the car. They could have gone straight to this, but that would have been very, very expensive and time consuming, which is where rough prototyping becomes very, very important. So that was the process side of things. Now for the people. What are the kinds of people that are in, uh, involved in design thinking projects? Well. 
the point of view we have is that we like to make teams with multifunct uh, multifunctional teams with diverse points of view. With this is the kind of usual people that you often see on teams, not necessarily just these kinds of people, but people from a lot of different backgrounds, both professional and personal. So the different kinds of people that are often involved and why? Well, engineer, for sure, um, usually because you're trying to make something at the end. But it's not just because the engineers know how to make stuff, but it's also because, uh, depending on the project, they know the limitations of technology. Uh, I teach at Design and Architecture here at the Kyoto Institute of Technology, and I have a lot of classes where it's just a team of design students. And what... I often end up seeing is these like magic bullet solutions. Right now it's AI. AI is going to solve everything. They don't fully understand how the AI works, but they think they have some idea and they can just say AI will do this. Some are realistic, some are not uh, so realistic. Um, next up is ethnographer, user research specialist. These are people, I've got to work with these people. These are people who just know how to sort of go into an environment, understand the space, ask the right questions to the interviewees, uh, et cetera, and be able to sort of take out as much insight from a situation as possible, as well as do the logistics of doing these kinds of field work. Then business specialists, depending on the project, you might want to do a lot of, let's say, research into the existing market, um, as well as maybe come up with sort of complex business models uh, to further sort of the complex business model to go with the product as well. And then last but not the least are the designers. Kind of weird, right? Like we're talking about design thinking, yet designers are the last people to show up here. Uh, usually in a team, designers have the ability to sort of visualize and synthesize information very quickly. It's not, they're not just there to make things look pretty, even though that is also a helpful skill to, tool set to have as well. And I also got a question saying like, is psychology an important part of design thinking? Um, I have heard of design thinking teams also incorporate psychologists as well. I have not worked with any myself, but I know they do have some parts in certain projects as well. And with any uh, field, there are actually different types of people. So with designers, there are the people who really want to make things look nice. And I have design students who will draw amazing uh, renderings of cars, and that's what they want to do. But this kind of more abstract sort of innovative work or product innovation is not something that's suited for those kinds of people. And I assume that's probably the uh, case for psychologists as well. You have psychologists who are there purely for the science, and there are psychologists who are more interested in being able to apply the things they know to making new kinds of products as well. Oh, okay, more questions. Could you elaborate on your understanding of multidisciplinary aspects inherent in design? Could you also illustrate your point with a few examples? Okay, examples I will definitely get to later. Um, well, yeah, design is inherently multidisciplinary, right? Because there are so many things that need to come together in order to make something. It's depending on the scale of anything, like it almost always takes tens of people, hundreds of people, like the computer that or smartphone that you're listening to me in right now, there are probably, I would venture to say at least hundred thousand people who are involved, not just design, but ultimately trying to get that to your uh, footstep. Even something like this glass, I would say probably takes hundred people from the beginning to the end to get it to you. So there are a lot of sort of, let's say, different kinds of skill sets and backgrounds that come into design thinking. And if you notice here, design thinking isn't one specific skill set that one person has. It's instead something that everyone sort of has as sort of, like a, let's say, secondary skill along their primary skill, of, let's say, being like a designer or an engineer or let's say marketer. Um, so that they can use their background that they have and also do these kinds of innovative projects as well. So last up is place and place is used quite uh, metaphorically. And the most important is definitely being closer to the context. Um, get out there, talk to people. I don't know how many of you listening to this have real world experience like working in companies, but you'd be amazed how many people 
are trying to come up with ideas and new products just by sitting in front of the computer. The amount of world you see is so limited when it's just through a tiny screen. Next up is adaptive workspace. As you saw for, probably from the process section, excuse me, uh, there's a lot of different kinds of work that gets done in these projects. So you need something that is very flexible uh, where you can make prototypes, have meetings, do brainstorming, etc. This is one of the workspaces from the, <laughs> Amit called it earlier, the legendary ME310 program at Stanford. It's called the loft space and you can see how much of a chaos it is. But that chaos also affords, um, affords for creativity as well. And of course, culture of new accepting new ideas. I'm putting culture under, let's say, the metaphor of place as well. But if you're really in a culture that's very conservative and keeps bashing any new idea that comes up, it's really, really hard to push something out there. Because with any, even with any great idea, often the first time it's mentioned, it sounds eh. It's very rarely you have an idea that sounds great at the beginning and is actually great at the end. So with that, I'm gonna jump into some case studies and might hopefully shed some light on the questions as well. Uh, but corporate case studies of companies that have incorporated design thinking into their processes. And by far the most famous in this world is PNG. Um, uh, is PNG active in India? Or do they have a strong presence? Yes. Okay, because they're not very strong in Japan, so a lot of Japanese people don't know it. But all right, so if they're active in India, you guys probably have heard of PNG and all the slew of stuff that they do. Well, a um, while back, they realized that they needed to have a new kind of approach to product development that they can sort of reliably replicate amongst all their different brands and product lines so that they can keep out competing the likes of like Johnson & Johnson and Kimberly Clark. And what they ended up doing was that until then, they actually worked a lot with IDEO. They had, they knew this consultancy well, they did really good design and product development work, but they wanted to sort of bring that mentality and way of working and thinking inside to the company. So they end up doing a lot of workshops with IDEO. And the cool thing I find about this story is that they did uh, two things for me that was quite unique, even to this day. One is that they did the train the trainers program. So the first ones were, of course, trained by IDEO people. But then they got people internally who could sort of, let's say, take the learnings and then redistribute it within the workshop themselves. So they created a way that this kind of knowledge uh, can, let's say, infect or multiply within the organization. And then the second thing that was cool is that they allowed people whose job weren't necessarily design or engineering or the people you often think of when you're thinking of new products, they allowed anyone to do it. So even the person who's doing accounting or legal or who's doing like facility management was able to do this because they realized this kind of thinking both needs to be ingrained in everyone's mind, but also is good not just for developing new products, but also developing the company itself. And here are some of the things that they came up with. One was, um, this is a really well-known case study. It's called the uh, Gillette Venus. It's woman's razor for uh, shaving hair in different parts of the body. And one insight they had was that, or actually until this point, a woman's razor was pretty much a men's razor used to shave like I do or not shave, I guess in Amit's case, but um, <clears throat> for take men's razor and turn it pink. And that was it. And that's how they were selling razors to women. They realized it's very different. First, they shave different parts of the body. They do it in the shower, not in front of the mirror. Um, and as a result, it's a very different form factor grip. They avoided the cliche pink color. They put a holder so that if you have it in the shower, it doesn't have to be lying usually in a puddle of water and it starts rusting a lot. It was just so many little details put into this product that ultimately won them the design of the decade gold award by the IDSA. Another project, and this one fascinates me, both from the way they did it as well as the uh, thing that came up with it. So once you get to the working world, if you haven't yet, you'll quickly realize that there are so many organizational barriers to getting anything done. 
as well as sort of this, let's say, culture or air inside of an organization that kind of says, you have to do it this way. And we're all kind of caught up in that. So what they ended up doing was trying to take that away as much as possible by having this like cool project space or loft space outside of their headquarters, I think in Cincinnati. And then they hired a lot of like uh, students to work in this organization called, or the project called the Clay Street Project to rethink what they can think of for whatever topic they were doing. And one team rethought of uh, cleaning clothes, so the detergent business. And I have no idea how this is going to sound in India. This sounds quite scary in Japan. Um, uh, it actually sounds scary in most places, except for American college students. So, okay, <laughs> bear with me. What this team realized was that most of us think of clothes as clean or dirty. It's clean, you wear it once, it's dirty, you wash it, and it's clean again. And we go through the cycle going from edge to edge. What these team of young people realized was that there is a group of young people, mostly college students, who see the middle. It's clean. You wear it once. Yeah, it's still okay. You wear it again. Okay, it's starting to smell a little bit, but I don't have a date or anything, so I think I can wear it. You wear it one more time, and it's, oh, this is really bad, but I have a test tomorrow. I don't have time to do laundry. And then it hits here, and then you have laundry. What they realized was that Laundry only takes you from one extreme to the other, or uh, detergent. You can have stuff in the middle, like removing stains or removing wrinkles or removing odors. And that is still a cleaning product in itself as well, which is how they end up coming to this brand called Swash. Um, I think they played around with Swash for about several years, and they ultimately put these products into the Tide product line as well. But it was a whole new way of seeing laundry that some people were doing, and they end up creating products for it. A couple other examples. This one true and dear to me because I was actually I had an internship here when I was young, when I was at Stanford, and they're Snaptics, the touchpad company. Chances are, if you have a laptop, you have a touchpad. The component is made by Synaptics, but they had an internal design team that was trying to reimagine the future of electronics for so many different categories and they ended up creating the Synaptics Onyx concept phone. It was the world's first ever touchscreen phone before the iPhone um, using like a finger touch. They did have a pen touch before that. Uh, the geek part of the internet went wild after this because they were like, oh, look how cool this device is. It's only a prototype. Uh, and the nice story would be and then Apple saw it and then they came up with the iPhone and bought Synaptics touchpads and made the iPhone. And that would be the amazing story. Unfortunately, um, Apple did see this for sure, made the iPhone, but ended up using the technology from some other company in Germany instead of Synaptics. So it wasn't really a good uh, business outcome for them. But so yeah, design thinking is good for all these kinds of breakthrough innovation things that are, or sorry, incremental innovation, things that are very much existing now but we want to get it better, like the razor, sorry, the screen, I didn't talk about this uh, case study, but also the packaging is, I would say is incremental as well, as well as breakthrough innovation, things that really are radically different and haven't existed before as well. All right, so that is sort of the talk I often give for design thinking. The second part of this talk, assuming I still have talk, time, right? Amit, how much time do I have left about? Uh, you have another 10, 15 minutes to go. Okay, cool. So with that then, I would like to talk about what I'm doing at university, sharing with more case study with you guys, just to hammer in this thought that design isn't just about making things look nice. So since I want to get to the case study, I'm going to jump around a little bit. Uh, it's this program that I run called MH310 Sugar. And it's basically where students at the university work with students from different universities. Um, to create breakthrough innovations along with companies as well. So yeah, okay, first case study. I think I have like five in here and I'm always more excited to talk about this. Uh, this was a project done by the Aussies, the Australians and the Portuguese, Portugal, uh, with the notion of an urban European commuting bicycle for a bicycle company. And the thing that they came up with was this, unbelievably different. Um, and there's a really good reason for all of this. First of all, it's three wheel. 
So it's not really a bicycle. They ended up going with a triwheel. And I have no idea what bicycle culture is like in India, but in Australia, as well as Europe and America, not in Japan, but in those countries, bicycle is one of those things where you like learn as a kid, like your parents would get you your first bicycle, you learn, but then you stop using because it's not really useful. They're car cultures. So the bicycle would sit in the closet and then like you would go through school and suddenly you're like 25 years old living in a city and like, hey, bicycles are cool. Uh, it's good for the environment. I should get a bicycle, but you haven't used it for 20 years. It's not particularly safe for these kinds of people. So they end up going with a tricycle. But the coolest feature of this is that it's actually foldable. And it's foldable in this format. You take the back wheel and bring it to the front. And it kind of becomes like a suitcase that you can pull. Not the most compact, but that's not what they were thinking of. Uh, the reason for this was that you can take it into metros. So Paris, London, Munich, Berlin, the biggest European cities have subways. But right under that tier is like Porto, where this university was. Uh, uh, Milan. Okay, Rome is big enough. Lyon, Marseille, like there's a lot of European mid-tier cities that are purely tram-based, tram and train, no subways whatsoever. And a lot of these trams, you can bring your bicycle in. So this kind of becomes like the last mile solution, right? You bike maybe two or three kilometers to the tram stop. You get off near the city center and bike another kilometer to your office, something like that as well. So very different kinds of bicycle. This one is a project that we worked on with the Italians, and it was unbelievably technology um, starting, which is basically a bolt. On, you would think it's a very ancient technology. Well, they made it very new. They had a what they call the IoT bolt where they put sensors inside the bolt so that it can sense like vibration, heat when the bolt is loosening. And they came at us saying like, what can we do with this? Um, and mind you, they had some ideas, but they wanted us to sort of uh, look into different markets and other places where this technology could be useful. And the students went all over the place. Dental implants, nope, it's too small. Chemical plants, I don't remember why this was not a good idea, but they followed this one. Uh, infrastructure was definitely the obvious starting point and a big one, but it turned out that the technology was way too expensive for something like this, as well as trying to maintain it for, I think, 40 years was quite a big challenge um, for something like this. They ended up here, roller coasters. Turns out Japan is a roller coaster behemoth, like the, some of the biggest companies are in Japan, and they are a pain to maintain. So every day they have to be maintained for two hours by technicians. Four days a month, there's the monthly maintenance. And then every year they overhaul, which means they take the roller coaster, take it all apart, all the cars, the moving parts. They take it all apart and then put it back together uh, to make sure that it's okay. This is usually something that airplanes and helicopters have to do, not like cars or bicycles. But roller coasters have to do this. And as a result, there was a lot of cost motivation to try to re uh, make this maintenance easier. Because right now it's very analog. This is the kind of thing they're doing. They're painting a line and walking around every day to make sure it's not loosened. Well, if the bolt can sense that, then yeah, why do you have to go take a look at it, right? So the thing that they end up proposing in the end was a fairly straightforward app to go with the technology that shows you how you can uh, use the technology to sort of maintain different kinds of roller coaster. By the way, the students absolutely love this project because for their field work, they kept get, getting to go to amusement parks and riding roller coasters. And the university had to be okay with it because it was part of the project. So yeah, this is kind of like the before and after, how much time they can save um, with the technology and the solution they were providing. So the other thing that's unique about this program is that I kept mentioning like us and the Italians or the Australian and Portuguese. Basically every project, there's students from two different universities working on it. So this is us working with Australians for a company called Yanmar. And <clears throat> every year there's a huge network of different universities that get together and form this network and do so. And this is actually how I know Amit as well, is that he was part of this network in his uh, previous job as well. So some people in the network, this actually did start from Stanford. I was actually a student in this, 20 years ago, 19 years ago, kind of scary how fast the time goes. 
yeah, so they're the kind of the founding uh, university, and it's actually in their mechanical engineering department. So it's not even their design department. Well, Stanford doesn't have a design department, actually, but it's their mechanical engineering design group that hosts this program. And then schools like Alto University, who has the who started the Alto Design Factory and the Design Factory Global Network. They got engineering, design, and business, all sorts of different disciplines who can come together and work on projects in a space like this. We got business schools in St. Gallen, University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. Uh, they tend to do a lot of service-based product uh, projects in the network. And more recently, I think their output was like a financial product or like an insurance product. So it doesn't have to be physical things or digital things. It could also be, well, I guess digital services kind of. Yeah, business school. So I think our biggest COVID did shrink us a little bit because it became a lot harder to, well, to be honest, uh, companies were holding back on sponsorships. But I think at biggest, we were like 300 people in the network as well. Um, are we about time or are we? can I still keep going? Another five minutes is okay. Okay, cool. I think I'm not sure if I'll run through all case studies, but then I can talk a couple more of the cool things we've done. Uh, we've done a lot of projects with a company called Yammar, who is a diesel engine company that makes boats and agricultural machines. And this has been a very big win for us. Uh, it was with our Australians and the project topic started as Vegas innovation for vineyards, the places where they make grapes, almost always for wine. Um, about 80% of the world's grape is actually for wine, not for eating the grape itself. And we did it with Australia because they have a lot of wine culture there. We have a little bit in Japan um, as well. But yeah, so the starting point was just target field, see what you need to make, see what kind of problems they're having, et cetera, et cetera. And this project had a lot of prototypes. So naturally for a farming project, the starting point was uh, harvesting. So trying to figure out what's the best way of sort of getting the grapes and collecting it. Turns out there's a lot of solution there that it wasn't very interesting or hard to come up with something entirely new. By the way, just looking at these prototypes right here, you can kind of tell that it's not the kind of pictures you see of prototypes when you type in that, type that into Google or when you see like companies announcing prototypes, right? So yeah, students did a lot of field work. This was a vineyard in Japan. And ultimately, the thing they found out that they could definitely focus on was this pesticide application. Until now, and still currently, a lot of pesticide is what they call spray and pray. Just blast it out and hope it gets to the right part of the plants. And only about 20% of the pesticide is actually, uh, pe sorry, pesticides and fertilizer only gets to the right place in the farm. So 80% is wasted which used to not be a problem because they're relatively cheap and uh, they're relatively cheap and environmental concerns weren't a big thing. Those things have changed drastically. It's getting a lot more expensive and people are much more concerned about the environment now. So what they end up wanting to do was, okay, we have to spray pesticide and fertilizer, but how can we contain it or control where it goes? And... <clears throat> They, what they end up creating, this was the first version of the prototype. What ended up creating was sort of a system that will cover three sides of it. I think this is an easier picture to tell. Three sides of it. And then the other two sides are actually has air curtains. I don't know if air curtains are a thing in India. It's not very common in Japan as well. But basically a blast of air to contain, sort of separate two different volumes from air from mixing. So that when you spray, it's fully contained in this area. And then you move that area through the vines so that about 95% of the spray will stay on where it is now. And I say this is a big win because, uh, oh, sorry. And this is what the final thing actually looked like when they built the prototype. So they didn't get to build the entire thing because we didn't have the time or the budget to do so. But they did create this part with the air curtains and ended up testing a lot with water, which is basically the same thing as a pesticide. Uh, and I say this is a big win for us because <clears throat> a couple months ago, no, about a year ago, someone from Yamar sent me this video <clears throat> saying, hey, it's finally a product. It took about six years between the time the 
project finish on our side for the company to actually get it to a product. And of course, the rendition has changed a lot. The underlying technology is a little bit different, but the premise is there. You contain three sides, have air curtain or something to contain the pesticide and out there, uh, and then have the machine go through. Now, aut uh, autonomous driving is much, much more common so that you can do something like this fairly easily. Um, maybe I'll stop here and try to handle questions since that was about five minutes, because this case study is a little bit long, or should I get through it? Oh, you can get through it, it's fine. All right, then, yeah, digital sample shop. This was a weird one. Uh, what the students end up coming up with was a chat bot where customers can come in and basically ask questions to a company with regards to a prototype they wanted to create. So you can see here like, okay, they're wanting to, this is the kind of things we want and the chatbot will interact with customers uh, <clears throat> to say, okay, this is what you can do. This feels fairly normal, right? Getting here was unbelievably convoluted. Uh, the company that we were working with is called Planze and they are a manufacturer of, I'm, all, I'm always gonna get this wrong, titanium and molybdenum, molybdenum, a very unique metal. Uh, parts and materials, both fabricated as well as raw materials. And they came to us and said, we want a digital sample shop. And the students said, why? Um, and by the way, that's always a good question you should ask your clients. Um, they just said, why? And it turned out that over the last 10 years, the kind of requests they are coming from, getting from the customers have been changing drastically. It used to be, we want 100,000 pieces of this kind of thing. Now it's like, we want three pieces of this really complicated thing, uh, much more of a prototype usage or like one-off usage rather than, a, let's say, a standard part as well. And their internal uh, workflow was not suited for that. And what they ended up needing was a way of filtering out all the customer requests to be able to say, okay, this is the workflow inside the company. So a lot of the research for this project was actually talking to people inside the company rather than people outside the company. <clears throat> and of course, yeah, they did talk to people who would be the kind of people using this chatbot. But in the end, the chatbot was good for the customers because it's very immediate, but actually much, much better for the company. And you can see sort of the internal interface here. We got this request. They used a little bit of, a, I mean, mind you, this is about five years ago. So it was a very rudimentary AI to analyze. This is definitely a prototype. Okay, here are the things you should do next or here are the people you should send this information to. So yeah, that was that. I guess I'll finish off. I think this was the last one I had. This one's a fun one. Um, another Yamar project, but this one was for their marine division. And basically new waterside leisure vehicle or goods, please make it fun and please try to use an engine uh, because they're an engine company. It was for their marine division. And yeah, the students tried some really weird things at the beginning. They had this robot that went around and you control it like a video game and pick up trash on the beach side. And they were like, oh, it's environmentally friendly and it's a fun game. Is it? Is it really a fun game? Uh, it really wasn't. <laughs> but they went out and in the middle of winter in Japan, when it was snowing, tried out all sorts of different water sports, talked to people who actually do water sports and came up with this insight that standing on water is fun. Uh, this is a pool they actually ended up building right outside of our loft space where they were prototyping things. Standing on water feels kind of unnatural, but it's a little bit fun. But it's also only possible if you have skill with like surfing or wakeboarding. And nowadays, a little bit of the stand-up paddle boards. But even those still, like you will fall over one more two times. So they wanted to create something where beginners can just stand and hang out on top of the water. Not so fast. Doesn't have to be like an extreme sport. And... Well, what they end up building was like a segue on water. So if you tilt one way, the thing will sort of gently move around so that you can walk around, um, walk around on water, not walk, but move around on water. And after the project was done, the team members actually uh, got contracted out by the company to further develop the idea. And they end up getting, 
uh, working with the company to getting it released. This is one of the few times when me as a, someone at the university gets to see how a company takes her idea further. And yeah, it got announced in 2019. And this was sort of a video taken off of their website. So it's not, as you can see, it's not like anything super fast or anything like that. But you can move around, hang out, sit around, do yoga if you want on top of it. I think that was some of the use cases they were trying to show. I think fishing is another uh, <clears throat> use case for it as well. And it's actually quite stable. Um, even the earlier prototypes were, because they were so big, they were quite stable as well. So yeah, I did go over time a little bit, I guess, but thank you very much for your attention. Hopefully you enjoyed, uh, let's say, very different kind of design with a lot of case studies. And yeah, any questions? I do see a couple questions here already, so I'm going to jump in with that first. But, oh, wow, okay, I could scroll. There are a lot of questions. I'm sorry, I didn't yeah. realize more questions. There, are, like, there yeah. are five, six five six questions already in the chat. And if there are more questions, please uh, feel free to add it in the Q&A section. Uh, thank you so much, Sushi. I think this was very fascinating. Uh, I mean, I'm sure everyone has probably enjoyed it as much as I have enjoyed it. Right? Looking at so many different kinds of projects and so many different kinds of ways in which design probably helps uh, us to do different things, achieve different kind of innovation, achieve different kind of goals, even for corporate sector is absolutely fascinating. So I am absolutely, you know, spellbound and thank you so much for doing this for us. Uh, there are, I think, some questions uh, in the Q&A section. We'll answer that. And if there are more questions, please type it down. So All right. I, yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll repeat the question for you, Sushi. So the okay. first question, uh, I think we answered till uh, question that Rohit asked about multidisciplinary aspect of design. Uh, Shreya wants to, I think, extend that question. And she's asking about how is design interdisciplinary in nature and how that interdisciplinary nature helps in fostering innovation. Okay. Uh, I, okay, I would venture to say that design does not have to be interdisciplinary. It often is, but I have also seen design teams that are, let's say, purely designers. And I want to say almost closer to being artists. Um, and this is probably true for, let's say, places like graphic design, um, one specific place I can see. Product design tends to become, or industrial design and product design tend to become more interdisciplinary just because there's so much more involved in making stuff that are, let's say, three-dimensional rather than something just on paper. But how does the interdisciplinary aspect help fostering innovation? If you think about where innovation comes from, it's often, it's actually very rare that someone has like suddenly a bright idea and that's this like amazing interdisciplinary, like, uh, sorry, not interdisciplinary, amazingly innovative idea. It's often a combination of different ideas that come together that make something actually quite innovative. And there are a lot of case studies in the corporate world where like a person A was working on this and had this idea and person B was working on this and had this idea. And turns out when you put those two together, it becomes a really, really interesting or amazing thing. Um, and very rarely are person A and person B in the same discipline because people in the same discipline usually have the same ideas. This is where sort of being interdisciplinary helps or like being sort of mashing up that discipline because there's a lot of common sense and basic ideas that are actually foreign in a lot of different places. Same goes for culture as well. Um, by the way, there are so many things that are obvious in some cultures and completely new to other cultures. Um, uh, just for fun, like, I feel like most countries in this part of the world have discovered curry. I have hmm. not seen anything similar in South America yet. Okay, hmm. I don't know that that's metaphor work. Hmm. Now let's move on. Okay, so we'll, we'll, I hope that answered your question, Shreya. So I'll move to the next question, which is by Anushri. She has two questions. We'll take one for now. And if we have time, we'll try and answer the second one as well. The first question is, does innovation happen from scratch? and become a completely new experience? Or is innovation a seamless integral part of already existing products and services? Okay, uh, I didn't have it in this slide, but the textbook definition of innovation, actually, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, if you look up innovation, it's actually quite broad and it can encompass both. 
Uh, earlier on, just quickly, I touched upon a little bit of material from innovation management of this notion of uh, breakthrough innovation versus incremental innovation. So incremental innovation is taking like an existing product uh, like this, like a microphone and making it a little bit better. Um, actually, this is this is a really good case study. I don't know if you guys know this company called Blue. Uh, they were always like the number two microphone company in the U.S. after Sure. Sure is like the famous one. Any rock musician is using a Sure microphone. Blue was very much in the shadows of that. In the mid-2000s, Blue ended up saying, you know what? Sure can have the professionals. We are going to go for these new kinds of people who need microphones called podcasters and YouTubers, these individual creators and they were the first ones to push microphones that can be connected to the computer by USB. That seems so obvious now, but they were the first ones to do it and ended up finding an entirely different market for it. Is that breakthrough? Is that incremental? Yeah, who knows, right? The line is very blurry, but some things like the iPhone is just obviously breakthrough. Something like this might be incremental, might be breakthrough. <clears throat> Um, as well. But yeah, so you get some things that are really out of nowhere. Other things are kind of on, on top of it as well. And just for a fun fact, this microphone blue, the guy who ended up doing this uh, was actually a classmate of mine at Stanford in this ME310 course, which is how I got yeah. it. Nice. Like buying the company and then rebuilding it. Nice, that's fascinating. Uh, one more question is around that. How can entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs leverage design thinking methodologies to identify new market opportunities and create disruptive solutions? <laughs> oh, the startup buzzword is in there, disruptive. I, I yes. don't know if like, solutions have to be disruptive. But okay, uh, this, is a, <laughs> sorry. this is a fun one. Give me a second. So design thinking uh, came actually from engineering. It came from mechanical engineering, at least a modern day version of it. Um, and of course, grew into a whole wide slew of places. But design thinking has always been about, that's a bit too strange of a thought. Design thinking is often focused on new product development. Who are the people who need new products? Well, startup companies as well as existing companies. And when design thinking came to light, the whole startup movement wasn't that huge yet. So the focus was very much on how uh, teams within existing companies can use design thinking to develop the next product. Uh, once sort of the startup thing became full blown and people were looking for methodologies and approaches to uh, make to make sort of uh, developing new startups more efficiently more, let's say, get the success rate up better, uh, came the whole notion of the lean startup. Maybe you might have heard this terminology as well. Lean startup and design thinking share a lot in common from the notion of experiment, like rapid experimentation, focusing on learning, uh, getting back to your customers or always checking with your customers, et cetera, et cetera. But there is also some a little bit different spots as well because design thinking, I don't want to say it doesn't focus so much on the business side, but the business aspect of a startup is actually quite different for a business aspect of a big company as well. So if you are very much like, I think design thinking or is very important for anyone trying to do anything new, but if you're interested in startups, I would suggest not just learning or reading up on design thinking, but also looking up into sort of how the lean startup movement is uh, taking off. And if you're interested in that, I suggest, I think the book is Lean Startup by Eric Reese and the Lean Launchpad, I think, by Steve Blank. Those are like the two books to read in that field. Or there are plenty of YouTube video clips as well, I'm sure. All right, okay. So we are running short on time, Sushi. I'm gonna uh, just conclude with one question. Uh, which I'm going to combine. So one question is about, will design thinking be overtaken by AI? And the second question around AI is that, what is your opinion about upcoming AI and its effect on designer jobs, especially designers who just do graphic design? Okay. <laughs> I'm glad you picked that one because I was like, oh, that's just going to be fun. 
Um, I think this is where we have to ask ourselves, what is the AI good for right now? How is it built up and how is AI good for? And the YouTuber, Tom Scott, I love the way he explained this. AI still today is amazing at completing your sentence. I start saying something and then the AI picks up the clue and everything and will finish the sentence for me. But the AI can't come up with a sentence for me. There's a very big difference on there. So if I know vaguely what I want, AI is able, if I know vaguely what I want, the AI can make that more specific for me. That's where a lot of the generative design for AI is going, right? With like the, uh, was it Midjourney or like the DeepMind? I'm not having these names right, but like the ones that create artwork from you from different uh, prompts. Uh, <clears throat> with regards to sort of the text-based AI, like the Bard and the ChatGPT, those are very much completing your sentence as well. And they rely so much on a huge body of knowledge that is built up on the internet. But the thing about new products is that we are often working in places where nothing has been done yet, in very much new areas. There's not a body of knowledge on the internet that's able, easily able to synthesize that yet. <laughs> Which I think where I think design thinking in this kind of work is fairly insulated from the rise of the AI with regards to at least jobs being taken from us. I think there will still be like a lot of good uses for AI. Like I think AI will be great in synthesizing information that gets absorbed from the internet as well as interviews and things like that. Or like uh, analyzing something like that. I think the creative aspect of connecting the dots and actually coming up with ideas and thinking of creative ways of prototyping and testing, being able to do fully that, I think AI would have a harder time. On the other side, the other kinds of uh, design jobs, the more, let's say, industrial design and the form giving or the graphic design, the very much resolving the little details of a finished product or the appearance on paper and whatnot. I think that world is going to get unbelievably disrupted by AI very quickly. Um, I'm already seeing people around me who are using, again, Midnight Journey is the name, but one of those like are uh, big AIs to create elements for posters and whatnot. And I'm not that good of a graphic designer. I never had training in it. And I can't wait for the day where I can just like make up something rough throw it in, say like, make it nicer, oh, change this, like where I could get to work with an AI like I do with a real human being, except it's instant and I don't have to pay for it. Um, so I think it's gonna be a really tough world for the that kind of design. Um, but I think it's gonna be a tough world for that kind of designer. Um, yeah, so again, AI, not one thing, design, not one thing. Think different kinds of people, different kinds of effects will happen. Cool. Cool. Nice. Thank you so much, Sushi. Uh, would you want to also conclude with uh, final concluding remarks in, let's say, sentence or so? Uh, sure. I mean, so I know there are people with a lot of different backgrounds here, some from design, some not from design. I hope I was able to sort of shed light on let's say the kind of design that you probably don't think about when you think of the word design. And if you were to have one takeaway from this, besides the fact that there's a person named Sushi Suzuki, which is kind of weird, um, is that with anything, but especially design, there are just so many different flavors and the nuances are what really, really matters. So before you put things into a box, just think why you are putting that box, but also what are the, the different flavors that of things that come into, especially with things like design. Hopefully that was good. Thank, thank you so much, Sushi. Uh, for me, the three things that came out of the talk today, I mean, other than seeing such brilliant projects, that most of the projects had the idea of experimentation and experience. 
you spoke a lot about that you know designers fail and it is okay to fail and because we learn a lot from that i think it's a very it's a quality that all designers whether you work in whichever field is important to imbibe and then of course you spoke about that you know ai is not with taking the design jobs away provided you are actually in the right field of design or looking at the right kind of design that you want to build in the future so thank you so much uh, and i really dearly look forward to having you on campus sometime soon come to india and and hopefully we'll be able to you know do this session in person with a much larger crowd and i'll have like you know all my students part of that session mm. yeah hope to make it back from there all right thank you thank you sushi have a good day bye take care thank bye you. have a good evening good day, thank you every thank you everyone thank you for joining in thank you see you around soon thank you man thank, thank you. you thanks bye, bye.